Um, I want to say a huge thanks to the exchange and to AIM for letting us use this space totally free, letting us use their projector and hooking us up with uh, drink buckets and all that stuff. So um, thanks to Katie for helping us get this set up and giving us this space. Okay, so um, I was trying to think of like what would be a good inaugural first talk to give for our Nebraska meetup, Nebraska VR meetup. And I figured kind of like a VR 101 thing. I don't know what everybody's backgrounds are, what everybody's experience with VR is, um, if you've been able to try it or not. So um, I thought this would be a good place to start. Um, a little bit about me. I'm a product designer at RaceNote. Um, I formerly worked at Huddle as a product designer there and a couple other places. And most importantly, I love VR. And I think it's really cool. I think it's going to be a tectonic shift for so many industries. Um, I think a lot of you think that too, and that's why you're here. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So let's start with some VR history and some awesome 80s art. Um, VR actually, like the word or the, the idea of virtual reality started in the 1950s. Um, a guy named Morton Heilig, um, a cinematographer, wrote about experience theater, and he wanted to create um, a cinema of the future that would encompass all of the senses. And so he created a prototype called the Sensorama. You can see it here on the right. Um, and that was in 1962 he released that along with five short films, one of which was a, just an experience of riding a motorcycle through Brooklyn. And so um, you could feel the wind on your face in this thing, uh, the vibration of the motorcycle seat, there was a 3D view all around you. And then somehow he incorporated like smells of the city. I'm not really sure how he did that, but we need to get that tech in VR stat. Um, and it was all mechanical. So this is all like belts and levers and stuff running this thing from the inside. Pretty impressive for 1962. Then in 1968, Douglas Engelbart, not pictured here. I don't know who these people are. Um, developed what is considered the first VR head-mounted display. Um, it was very primitive, very, very heavy. It's actually suspended from this rig here. That's how heavy it is. And because of its appearance and how menacing it looks, it's called, uh, it was called the Sword of Damocles. <laughs> then in 1982, Atari formed the Atari Research Lab. And they started to experiment with VR and different tech, but um, the 1983 video game crash shut that down pretty quick. But this is important because some of the notable employees from there went on to form um, and create pretty cool VR tech, one of which is this guy, uh, Jaron Lanier. He founded uh, VPL Research in 1985, and he actually popularized the term virtual reality and developed several VR devices, um, one of which was the Data Glove, which was bought by Mattel and became this piece of technology called the Power Glove, which didn't ever really take off, but is pretty well known in popular culture. Um, another device that he created was the iPhone, phonetically similar, similar but not quite as popular as the one we know and love. Um, skipping forward to this guy, this is Philip Rosedale. He created um, Linden Labs um, in 1999. He initially wanted to focus on hardware, and they had this idea for something they called the rig, which was this like shoulder-mounted multi-monitor thing that like encompassed your face. Um, but they really struggled to get that to work, so they switched their focus to software and called it Linden World, where users could create an avatar and participate in task-based games and socialize in 3D environments. But Linden World, you probably haven't heard of, but you probably heard of what it became, Second Life. Um, Second Life had reportedly one million regular users in 2013, and it's this persistent online world where you can kind of live your second life, and um, there's a whole like e-commerce and um, content creation and value trading and all, all sorts of stuff. There's like a mini economy in this. Um, so we've, we've got all these things that kind of were happening over the last like 50, 60 years, but they didn't really come together because the price, um, 
the limited computing power and high cost of bringing these things all together um, we just limited the access for people to VR. Um, it was mainly used over the last 50 or 60 years for uh, medical training, for flight simulations, automobile, automobile design, and military training. Um, and so that was the main use of VR until about six years ago. And then in um, 2010, this guy, this is Palmer Lucky, he built the first prototype of the Oculus Rift in 2010. And two years later, he created a Kickstarter campaign that raised 2.5 million from 10,000 different backers. Um, that company was acquired by Facebook for $2 billion in 2014. And then in 2016, or March of this year, the first consumer version of this shipped. Um, it still requires a pretty high-end PC to run it, um, but it's, it's one of the higher premium versions of VR, the Oculus Rift. Um, and the success of this Kickstarter campaign gave confidence to a number of other players in the space. Uh, HTC and Vive partnered together to create the, HTC and Valve partnered together to create this device, the HTC Vive, which um, is the first one that has like touch and motion controllers and it's room scale VR so you can set it up and move about the entire room. That released to the public in April of this year. Um, meanwhile, uh, this is back in, in 2014, but uh, two Google engineers, David Cause and Damian Henry, uh, in their 20% Google innovation time, they introduced or they created this Google Cardboard platform, a really cheap way to get access to VR from anybody's uh, phone. They introduced this at Google I.O. in 2014. And um, as of January 2016, over 5 million cardboard viewers have shipped and there's been over 1,000 compatible apps published to their Play Store. Following the success of this, this year they introduced the Daydream platform. Um, they announced this at Google I.O. this year. Um, along with hardware and, and har hardware and software specifications for low latency devices, low persistence displays, minimum CPU and GPU performance, essentially to create a standard for phone-based VR, like the minimum that you need to have a good experience and not get sick. Uh, the first piece of hardware for this platform actually ships within the next month. Uh, the first Daydream-ready phone devices and the first uh, viewer pictured here along with the remote. Also, PlayStation is in the space. They started working on a head-mounted display in 2014 under the codename Project Morpheus. They combine this with their existing tech, the PlayStation Eye camera and the PlayStation Move controllers. You do need a PlayStation 4 to run this, um, but I think that makes it kind of unique in the space that there's a huge install base for PS4, and so if you have that already, you don't have to buy a PC in addition to your um, head-mounted display, as is the case with the Rift and the Vive. And that started shipping this week. So kind of all of that, like I skimmed over a lot of stuff, but that brings us to today, kind of the landscape. There's a ver various hardware at various prices, um, but the big deal is that this, all of this happened this year and makes VR more accessible than ever before. According to Upload VR, there are 7 million VR devices in the wild. Uh, over 100K devices are sold every month, and according to their research, uh, 47 million people under the age of 40 plan to get a VR headset in the next two years. So this really is a ripe time for VR. Like, this is about to explode if all of our compasses are pointing in the right direction. So it's a really exciting time. Um, I want to talk about content a little bit for a minute. Um, I'm not going to dive too deep into this stuff because I think this is really good content to dive deeper into for future meetups. But um, there's a number of different areas that content is really being pushed forward. Um, this is a screenshot from Alamet, which is a um, animated short from Penrose Studio. Um, a lot of these, there's a bunch of these in the, the different stores right now, and they're really cool. It's almost like um, being at the theater, like it's live, but it's like these little miniature characters, and it's it's really it's really interesting. I'm excited to see where this goes. It's kind of a blending of live theater and like movie special effects. Um, also in this category. Um, Oculus Studio, their story studio, made one called Henry that actually won an Emmy this year, which is a huge deal, proving out the, um, 
the merit of VR storytelling. Uh, this is an example of VR photography or uh, video, video or photosphere photography. Um, the applications for this are huge. This is really cool because it's the easiest type of content to create for VR. I mean, you've got a camera right there. Um, you can get an app on an iPhone or on an Android phone that you just spin in a circle, and it creates this type of content. And it can transport you to this place for you know, very, very low cost of actually creating this content. And this is going to have huge implications for tourism, for real estate, any scenario where you want to check out a space, but you can't actually be there or you don't want to go there. Um, Facebook's already creating a really cool bridge with this type of content where you've seen people post their 360 photos and you can pan around it. So it's kind of an example of like progressive VR content where even if you don't have a head-mounted display, you can still view that content. VR video is the next category. Um, this is from the Yosemite. I can't remember the title of this one. Anybody know the name of this one? But it's, it's where uh, they kind of filmed Obama visiting Yosemite, and it talks about our national parks. Um, this is cool because it, really it does feel like you're there. Um, there's still kind of an issue with image quality. Like, because of the, the capture rate and stuff, it, it kind of appears like closer to 5, 520p video. And you really need something like 4K or 8K video for it to start to look really realistic and feel like you're actually there. Video games. I love video games because, so I work at RaceNode and we, we uh, work in motorsports and like racing is like the top tier of like everything that comes down to our cars, right? So they, they have engineers that push cars to their limits and they figure out how that stuff can apply to consumers. Video games are that for computers, right? You figure out how to maximize the performance of the machine, get the most out of it. And um, this is a really fun space and obviously where most people are focusing, right? Oh no. I don't know what happened. Yeah. It's, a, it's OK. Out, so I'm, it's I've only got a few more slides, so. A few more slides? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just talk, and we'll sure. keep going. So anyway, yeah, video games, that's a huge space. Um, lots of, now that went out, too. OK, we're good. Um, as far as content goes, um, Facebook especially is really heavily invested in content creators. At Oculus Connect this year, they said that they've already invested 250 million in content creation, and they're going to invest 250 million more. So if you're looking to get into VR content creation, you should hit them up because they've got the cash. Um, I mean, really, like the thing that's amazing about VR, and everybody that I've showed it to, the thing that I continually hear is that it's magic, right? Like when you put it on, it's kind of uncanny how you're transported to somewhere else. I remember the first time I tried the Rift, um, I was at Huddle and one of my coworkers had a headset and he was like, hey Josh, come check out this, this just like basic demo I set up. And it was just like a football field, really low res, like it was just in a void, there was nothing around. And all the players were just like uh, blocks and cones. But when I put the headset on, I just, I was like, how did I get here? I was just at the office, how is this possible? Um, and I think that is really the key to like why I think this technology is going to be different than other things that are more gimmicky, maybe like 3D movies that never really took off. Like I think this is really going to be an, an industry-changing technology for computing and so many other industries like architecture. I'm glad we've got architecture represented here tonight. Um, there's a quote from this book by Liv Erickson, who's a, a VR developer and evangelist. Um, she said, as human beings, we're spatial creatures who think and interact in three physical dimensions. But th for the past several decades, all of those interactions have happened on variations of a 2D screen. Virtual reality has the potential to change the relationship between humans and computers to make digital information more powerful and easier to understand. And I think there's so much opportunity in this space and like why can't Nebraska be a hotbed for innovation, for us to make new discoveries, make awesome content. Um, and so that's why I, I created this meetup. I wanted us all to get together to help each other out and to build an awesome VR community here in Nebraska. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, does anybody have any questions?